Well, Henry, let's see what we talk about today. What, uh, what's, uh, what's on your mind? Some old experiences? Some, uh, some of the early days? What was your happiest time that you can think of? Something that, yes, that you reflect uh, in your books, maybe? Yes. As I, as, as I ask you. Sure. Well, uh, obviously, <coughs> Paris in between 32 and 38, was that the, the happy time? The, the two happiest times, I think, in my life are my childhood days on the streets in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, you know, the 14th Ward, right. up to the age of nine. Huh? And then this period in Paris, uh, particularly 32 and 33, when I lived in Clichy, outside the gates. It was a working man's quarter. Now, tell us about Clichy. But Clichy was when I lived with this chap, Perlez, who uh, wrote that book about me. And um, it was the period when I wrote Black Spring. And I was also writing the book on Lawrence, which I never finished. And I was writing, uh, I think, Capricorn and some other. I was on about four books at one time. It was the first time we had a break in the sense that we had a place to live, do you see? And um, we had a bike, each of us. That was very important. We were working uh, in the early part of that period on the Tribune, the Chicago Tribune down the cellar. He was, we were both proofreaders. And we almost elected uh, to be proofreaders rather than to be uh, the upstairs guys, do you see? No responsibilities, just uh, this drudge work which didn't kill us. We uh, would start to work, uh, first have a couple of coupes of champagne, which was about, I should think, about seven cents then. Do you know a coupe? before starting out to take our walk to the office, you know. What time of day? Uh, evening. Got to work, uh, I think it was about 8 o'clock, 8.30, something like that, and worked till 2. And then uh, we went to eat in a restaurant nearby, in a bistro, where all the uh, prostitutes came in the evening for their meal with their mackerel, with their uh, pimps, do you see? We all ate at the same tables. And then the guys from upstairs also would come down. And we'd sit there till three, four, sometimes five in the morning. And then walk from uh, there, you know, a long walk across Paris, you see, in the dead of the morning, the early hours of the morning. Marvelous, marvelous feeling. The only person you'd encounter would be the bicycle cops, always in pairs with their capes, don't you know, and their high boots, do you recall? That noise, that little grinding noise of the chain was very wonderful in the silence. Paris is so silent, I think, at night, you know? More so than uh, any city I know of. Mm. Yes. When you came well, to Well, it was days of uh, carousing, working hard at the same time, burning the candle at both ends, don't you know? Yes. Well, you finish at two, and you had a good two-hour dinner and a walk, and then to bed. That then to bed. Not right. burning much candle there, doing a little. Well, eating. I mean, we had such we had marvelous times, you know. In between, <laughs> um, it didn't seem possible you could do. Now, when I think of it, having uh, the quiet place in Big Sur, often the contrast enters my head. There, I had a job, even you know, night job, long walks. Much drinking, feasting, do you see? And bicycle rides, as I say. Yet I seem to have time for more things than I do living in the country where I'm supposedly isolated. It's a strange thing. That is one thing every exile in Paris talks about, I think. The fact that he could do everything in a day. <laughs> in Paris? In Paris. It seemed so. You seem to have... Uh, the opportunities for doing all manner of things in 24 hours was much here, anywhere here, do you know? I'll explain it. I can't any more than that it happened. I can't, you know? You live quietly in Big Sur now. There are fewer interruptions. There are more interruptions, in a sense. Uh, then, nobody was bothering me, knocking at my door, you see? I uh, had seclusion then. Now I'm exposed to the world. Anybody knocks any time of the day, do you know? And I'm his victim. Do you mean then to be productive, you've got to be unknown? 
In a way, I think that's uh, quite important, yes. It's almost so, unless you could erect uh, rigid barriers around you, you know, which seems impossible. There's one man I often think of. You know this friend that I tell you about, Perlez? I enjoyed so much his uh, routine. He had found out that if he only told himself, that if he told himself that he would only write say, uh, two pages a day, and no more, he'd feel wonderful the next day. And he would do it deliberately, though he could write six, eight, or ten. He'd stop at the end of the page whether it was finished or not, that sentence, do you see? Years later, I found out that Thomas Mann wrote only one page a day and corrected it to the nth degree so that it would be perfect, but not more than one page. But the only thing is, Thomas Mann is unique in that he did it every day of his life, Sundays included, do you know, huh? There were no inter no uh, variations. And look what he turned out. What a massive production his is, huh? This is something very interesting, you know, because people think they've got to work like dogs, do you see? And they work in spurt, uh, spurts, don't you know? And then they're fatigued, and there are long layoffs, periods of disgust, you know, self-criticism. But aren't there periods when a creative writer gets in touch with the electric current and, that's right. and the wheels buzz faster? I can, that's, that's my, um, my uh, experience, but I suppose each one uh, decides for himself how he will approach his work. But the moral of this other is how much you can do by doing little and doing it regularly. Do you see what I mean? You know that in one page a day makes 365 pages, which is a good-sized book, isn't it? Tell mm. me, uh, I don't know if you've ever told it in print. You're a Capricorn. It means you were born in that astrological... In that means that sign. the 21st of December to yeah. the 21st of January. Yeah, yeah. Is that any relationship to the title of Tropic of Cancer? Well, yes. I, uh, I, you see, I had started with Tropic of Cancer. And that was a symbolic title I'd chosen for a number of reasons, primarily because the cancer is the crab, and the crab has the uh, power or the, uh, b uh, the ability to walk backwards, forwards, sideways, any direction, do you see, at ease. I like that symbol, do you know? That indicated a man uh, uh, adept in his environment? In a sense, uh, able to go any direction at will, do you see, yes, yes. Tropic meant his area? Yes, 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 it's very loose, you know, and of course it has the geographical thing, Tropic of Cancer, you know, the temperate zone, and my thought, well, I did that. Then I had no thought of the next titles, but when I came to the next one, I thought, well, why not make it Tropic of Capricorn, you see. I was going to try to have one for just the equator. Well, finally I had made Black Spring. Uh, that had another great significance to me. Um, but there was always the astrological implication, too, sure. Cliché was a happy period, I can see that. It was, it was, yes. What, yeah. did, what did your room cost you? Did you, two of you live in one little room? No, we had what you'd call a, a flat. <laughs> it had a kitchen and it had two bedrooms. Oh, yes. It had a kitchen, two bedrooms, that was it, yes. And the, uh, we were overjoyed when we got the money. We borrowed the money from some wealthy woman to pay the, the installment, the first installment. We uh, arrived with our valises, and we looked. We turned the light on, and we look, and I saw a part of the wallpaper torn. I go, and I pull it away a little. He's pulling away at another part of the wall, and soon we noticed bed bugs, bed bugs, crawling up and down the wall, you know. We dropped the valises, ran down to the concierge, you know, said, we'll be back in three days, fumigate the place first. <laughs> uh, and she did? Yes. Oh, yes. Mm. Mm. In the cafe, but, in yes. the cafe that you, when you finished your work as, as proofreaders at the Chicago Tribune, you went to a cafe where the prostitutes in their lovers, they're macaro. Yes. Most of the girls have a steady fellow? Yes, it seemed. Uh, there was only one I noticed who didn't. I was an Algerian girl. Oh, God, what a girl. 
beautiful looking, heavy, you know, heavy face, but marvelous beauty, this North African type. And extraordinarily enough, she was an artist, a painter, showed us her work. She wrote poetry, and she would come some nights with Paul Valéry's poems and uh, read them to us. A young uh, girl. Well, in her thirties, I'd say, yes. That was pretty old. None of them, by the way, looked very battered and bruised. We get this impression that prostitutes are such beaten up creatures, do you see? The thing I always admired about a good French prostitute was that she didn't allow that to happen. She used her wits, and she didn't have that moral feeling that others do, like the English girls, let's say. You know, they get so uh, beaten over it, don't they? These think, uh, as I found them, well, they, it was something you have to do. It's a business. It's honorable. You're doing your best, you know. One day we'll retire. We'll find a man. We'll marry him. We'll go to the country and have children and have a farm, do you see? That's the thought, the ideal. And many do carry it out. Yes. I want to get back to uh, Clichy and yes. uh, the days in Clichy and this fascinating kind of nightlife. I take it it was it was basically nightlife because you had a night you had a night job. That's right. We would wake up say around noon every day, don't you know? And then have this um, breakfast lunch sort of thing and uh, write a bit and then uh, go for a spin on the bank. You see we weren't far from the outskirts of the city. We could dive into the suburbs, do you know? And uh, we'd go to all manner of places and uh, then have a, a meal again before starting out to, the, to work. And often that restaurant where we ate before we went to work was a, a, another type of restaurant, a working man's restaurant. And the meals was very, were very cheap there. I can just tell you, I can remember it cost about 10 francs then. And if we, 10 francs. 50 cents? Less, uh, about 25, 25 to 30, do you see? And if we wanted to splurge, we'd raise it, say, to 14. That would give us a better wine, and it would give us, say, chicken instead of boiled beef or whatever it might be. Do you know? And that was a marvelous difference. Four francs, just think of it. You know what that means, huh? A little jump like that. Now, let me tell you that the ordinary American in Paris, he'd be spending 18 to 30 francs a day for those meals and think he was eating reasonably well and moderately, do you see? Yes. But these were joints where we saw the same people every night, sawdust floor, you know, paper laid over the table for each customer, a napkin, you know, and um, curious people, people that you only nodded to, some you said a phrase to, do you see? You never got into any real intimacy with them, but you always greeted them intimately, tenderly, do you know, as you entered. But there was never any intrusion on your privacy. Uh, and opposite it, I could, we always sat, we could watch outside the window across the street, there was a bordel. Uh, not a bordel, excuse me, a hotel. And on the corner, especially on a rainy night, it was interesting, on the corner, just a few uh, doors up the street, there always stood two or three girls with umbrellas up. That's such a strange, lovely sight, really, isn't it? Uh, it's so respectable at once, you know. <laughs> And they look just like anybody else with the umbrella. And there they are soliciting. And then, while we'd be eating, you'd see them pass along, go up with their clients, you know, upstairs, do you see? There was this coming and going. That all seemed to wash in with the food, don't you know? Uh, uh, it, it was part of the repast, you know. Our bikes were hitched to the curb outside. <laughs> um, yes. And, of course, you know, it was only a few blocks up that street. This was uh, on the, um, the Rue de Clichy, leading up to uh, the Place Clichy, where the famous Café uh, Vepler was. And that was um, quite a wonderful place. 
from there, you know, it was like Broadway, great blazing red lights all the way up to the Moulin Rouge there, the Place Pigalle, do you know? 